This video is going to be a little different to my normal ones. I usually need to do lots of research to get the story straight, but not this one. This was basically a brain dump. If you don't know, I once many moons ago worked for Microsoft in the Automotive Business Unit or ABU. In fact, this is an, uh, an ABU t-shirt. I started working on the Auto PC, the car stereo you see behind me there. And although I missed ABU's crowning glory, the Ford Sync system, I was back in the team to witness firsthand the chaos of the infamous My Ford Touch project. Not much is out there about some of the background to what happened, and I've always wanted to tell the real story, what Ford's PR department didn't want you to hear. So sit back and learn about the project that helped sink Ford's JD Power ratings and the story of how they dug themselves out of the hole. This is the My Ford Touch story. It all starts with Ford and Microsoft's work on the Ford Sync project between 2005 and 2007. If you want to know more, I've done a whole video about it. Long story short, Ford Sync was a small piece of hardware that mainly used speech to allow for Bluetooth hands-free phone calls and to play music through iPods or USB memory sticks. Although the team at Microsoft was burnt out getting it shipped, it was a massive success. Microsoft handed the product off to their support team to work with Ford on expanding it eventually to pretty much every car Ford made. Ford thought Sync was fantastic. Due to popular demand, it sold more cars, and they sold it for 10 times the cost of the hardware. Customers liked it as well. Sync was worth more in a used car than the price you paid for it when new. For the next version of Sync, Ford wanted it to have its own touchscreen and for it to control more of the car's features, such as climate control. This meant fewer buttons, which meant a cheaper vehicle while allowing for higher revenue. This was the early days of Android, and in particular the iPhone, which had launched just days after the Ford Sync broke cover, and touchscreens were on everyone's lips. So Ford was keen to work with Microsoft again, but Microsoft wasn't so keen to work with Ford. They'd spent years producing, essentially, a custom system for Fiat, Blue and Me, and now they'd done a second custom project for Ford. Most departments in Microsoft want to write code once and sell it many times and there was a keen desire to move back towards a standardized Microsoft automotive operating system. This could be taken by OEMs or original equipment manufacturers such as Bosch or Delco and offered to car companies. Microsoft had had some success doing this, but they wanted to do more of it, especially now that their product was in high demand after the success of Blue and Me and Ford Sync. When Ford came calling to work on the next project, Microsoft were happy for Ford to use their operating system, which they called Microsoft Auto, but didn't want to do all that customization work. And with this being a V2 product and Ford being much more adept at helping create in-car entertainment systems, it seemed to make more sense that Ford run the project. Ford looked around for a software company to help them build on top of Microsoft Auto. One promising candidate was a company called B-Square. They worked just a stone's throw from Microsoft in Bellevue, Washington, and one of their first projects was extending Microsoft Auto's operating system, Windows CE, to support other CPUs. With a good working knowledge of how Microsoft Auto ticks, connections to Microsoft, and an ability to write custom code, they seemed ideal. This is where my knowledge gets a little bit hazy as I wasn't working for B-Square, and I don't know what happened between Ford and B-Square. What little I do know has come from stories that were told by Ford and Microsoft people I met when working on the project later. So take all of this with a little bit of a pinch of salt. However, one thing's clear, Ford have always had very definite ideas about what their product will be. They create very detailed specifications and expect the product to follow them to the letter. This ended up working out well in the Ford Sync project because Microsoft wasn't afraid to push back when they saw a Ford plan was unworkable or felt that they had a better solution. And of course, Microsoft didn't understand some of the nuances of the car industry and why Ford was making the calls they did. But on the whole, it was a productive time when each company gave as good as they got and the friction created a better product. B-Square were a tiny company compared to Ford, and the demanding Ford relationship didn't work so well. 
B-Square were an outside contractor, so when they were told to make a product the way Ford wanted, they made it the way Ford wanted. They didn't have the muscle to push back on what could be seen as bad design decisions, and this laid the groundwork to the problem. Now, I'm not rubbishing B-Square here. They're a fine company and have made some excellent products. But what I think happened was a failure for both companies to connect on technology and timelines on this particular project. Those early decisions would have disastrous consequences. One choice was to use Adobe's Flash product for the user interface. There were a lot of different screens on the proposed My Ford Touch product, and building them in Flash was a much faster way of creating a user interface. Microsoft Auto didn't have its own compelling user interface at the time. If this were to be done today, likely B-Square and Ford would have used HTML5, but this didn't exist around 2009 when the companies were working on it. Flash had been made to work on Microsoft Auto, so it seemed to make sense to use that. However, what both companies hadn't done was work out how fast Flash worked on the proposed CPU Ford wanted to use, a 400 MHz chip if I recall. Both companies would find out much too late that the system worked at a glacial pace with Flash as the user interface, and as neither company could change the Microsoft Auto operating system or the Flash implementation, they weren't able to make it any faster without choosing a faster CPU. That's also a tough thing to do when the hardware has been finalized and manufacturing has begun. Both companies had also underestimated the amount of time it would take to get the product ready, and Ford had put a firm date on the release that couldn't be slipped. They were launching my Ford Touch in the new Ford Edge, Ford Explorer, and Lincoln MKX in 2010. The Edge and MKX were particular problems, as some parts of the car, for example the climate system, could only be operated through the my Ford Touch system. They literally couldn't release the car without my Ford Touch, and with tooling and factories being geared up for the release date, slipping wasn't an option. Despite this, B-Square's PR department was touting the new product they created with Ford up until July 2010. So when my Ford Touch launched in the summer of 2010, what the public got was quite frankly a mess. It was slow, and using a resistive touchscreen for drivers with gloves didn't help as it was inferior to capacitive touch used on modern smartphones. The hazard warning button was installed just under the screen, so your palm hit it as you were trying to steady your hand to hit the touch controls. The screens were a bit of a chaotic mess. Presumably, neither team had employed the necessary user interface staff, or maybe they'd simply run out of time. But the main problem were the bugs. So many bugs. It wasn't uncommon for the device to reboot every time you took a short 20 to 30 minute drive. When you were trying to listen to music, make a phone call, or alter the climate, this was simply unacceptable. The reviews for the new car were scathing. The car itself was just great, but my Ford Touch was torn apart. This and the poor quality of the Ford Fiesta's automatic gearbox were the two black spots that sent Ford's JD Power ratings plummeting from 5th in 2010 to 23rd in 2011. Lincoln's rating fell from 8th to 17th. Consumer reports recommended customers not buy any car with my Ford Touch installed. And with these consumer ratings being so highly thought of by the public, this was killing Ford sales. Where Ford Sync had been the goose laying the golden egg, my Ford Touch was the touch of death to every car it was installed in. So this is where I enter the picture. I just started working on the next version of the Microsoft Auto operating system when in 2011 we were told to down tools and fix my Ford Touch now. Microsoft CEO Steve Barmer and Ford CEO Alan Mulally knew each other well, and of course the Ford and Microsoft teams were old friends. So when Ford realized too late the B-Square couldn't dig them out of the hole they'd found themselves in, they turned to Microsoft to fix my Ford Touch. No more crashing, a faster system, and a user interface that made sense. I remember just after we started working on the My Ford Touch project, the entire team went on a training course to improve our skills running projects. The speaker showed us some of the things that we should never do, and one was to try and fix a project that was badly broken. The sheer amount of work it takes to fix bad code is a magnitude higher than writing the whole thing again from scratch, yet this is just what we were being told to do. 
We couldn't just take 12 to 24 months and rewrite it. Every day Ford had the product in the market was a day that they were losing market share. And there was a very real worry that a class action lawsuit could be put together by my Ford Touch owners. In fact, in 2013, this exact thing happened and Ford set aside $17 million to pay affected customers. Ford couldn't simply stop building three of its mainstream cars while Microsoft rewrote the code and the team wasn't large enough to fix the existing product and write a new one at the same time. Ford would simply lose too much face from something so deeply embarrassing. We agreed with Ford to have updated versions of the code every three months to slowly improve the product. This meant my Ford Touch had to keep using Flash and this limited the amount of improvement Microsoft could make. The first goal was to stop the most heinous crashes in the first three months and to fix the ugly user interface, which was actually the easiest job as Microsoft already had a team of user interface people. But fixing this mountain of bugs was so hard. I remember going through lists of hundreds of customer reported bugs just in the product area I was working in. Becoming acquainted with B-Square's code would also take time and the team had to decide what modules of the system could be rewritten and which of them could simply be patched. To give you an idea of the gargantuan task to get my Ford Touch working correctly, the Microsoft Automotive team started hiring immediately and at one point there were 250 people working solely on fixing my Ford Touch. The main thing that annoyed me at the time was what the press said about my Ford Touch. They laid the blame firmly with Microsoft and Ford didn't rush to correct them. It was Microsoft's operating system, so it was their fault. As I've already laid out, it clearly wasn't Microsoft's fault. And in fact, we were the knights in shining armor coming in to clean up the mess. But Microsoft's marketing team agreed to take the fall. Ford had people permanently camped out at Microsoft's offices in Bellevue. Interestingly, our offices were less than a 15 minute drive from B-Square's offices, yet we never talked. Slowly the system got more stable to be easier to use and faster. It would never be that fast and with a resistive touchscreen it always felt you were having to use it in slow motion. But it slowly got to a point where it was usable. Every three months the updates were pushed out to Ford who would install them on new vehicles. But dealers would also have the software that they could use to update vehicles when they came in for servicing or if the owners simply wanted their latest update. And once the software was relatively stable, Ford sent a USB stick and an SD card to all my Ford Touch owners in spring of 2012 with instructions on how to update the device themselves. Ever since Ford designed my Ford Touch, they'd always planned to use it as their premium in-car entertainment system around the world. Once the worst of the bugs were handled, Microsoft worked on extending my Ford Touch to work on these new vehicles. I was working on the radio feature and was responsible for extending my Ford Touch to work with DAB along with a Microsoft team in Munich. Our work went into the release of the new Ford Mondeo. New cars meant new CD and radio modules and each implementation had its own unique way of operating which caused no end of headaches. Although the Microsoft Automotive team moved off the My Ford Touch project in 2013, Ford was still providing software updates as late as 2016, although I don't know what team was doing the work. It's possible it was small patches by Microsoft's support team that provided updates to support newer phones or media devices as they had done for the original Sync product. After the mess that was my Ford Touch, Ford wanted to quickly replace it with something better, maybe a faster processor, no resistive screen and something that didn't use flash. Microsoft Automotive had shown it could deliver good products and there was hope that they could supply the next generation product. However, changes in the Windows team would scupper any hopes of that. With Windows 8 released in 2012, Microsoft had attempted to expand Windows to both Intel x86 and ARM CPUs. They also wanted to kill off the Windows CE operating system that Microsoft Auto was based on as they believed it didn't make any sense to put resources into two different operating systems that basically did the same thing. The problem for the Microsoft Automotive team though was that although Windows supported ARM CPUs, it didn't support Freescale ARM CPUs. These were cost-effective automotive grade chips that were perfect for in-car use and something competitors products used. 
The other problem Microsoft Automotive had was the minimum amount of memory Windows needed was significantly higher than Windows CE, also adding to the hardware cost. Microsoft pitched their new product using one of the Windows team's recommended CPUs and the extra RAM that would be needed, but it was a forlorn hope. The hardware cost was incredibly high and it made no sense for Ford to go with Microsoft's solution. Ford went with a solution from BlackBerry-owned QNX to make the follow-up to my Ford Touch, dubbed Sync 3, that was rolled out in 2016 model cars. It was installed on new hardware and was available to upgrade existing my Ford Touch cars. Sync 3, of course, didn't use Adobe Flash. The Microsoft Automotive team was dissolved shortly after, and all the staff were moved from working on the Ford Edge car to work on Microsoft Edge. My Ford Touch is a story of how not to run a software and hardware project. Don't build a car that relies on one component, especially if that component is something new and risky. Work very closely with your suppliers and have regular deliverables that give you confidence you're on track. If early versions of a software product are slow, they're unlikely to get any faster. In fact, as more modules are completed, it's likely to get slower and have people in your team who have sufficient technical knowledge of the component that's being supplied so that they can ask the right questions. Well, it's good to get all that off my chest. <laughs> to round out the story, the class action lawsuit settled in 2019 with claimants able to get up to $400 in compensation. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you in the next video.